afternoons. Uh, we find that that's the best way uh, for uh, really to make a complete experience. You'll get to know each other on a much more meaningful lev level um, after each afternoon and in the evenings with cocktails and dinners and things like that. So uh, we encourage you to um, lay, let the guard down. Uh, it's an informal process and experience and uh, you'll get much more out of it um, if you just speak from your hearts and get to know as many people as you can. That's, that's the magic in the experience. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes here. Uh, we do have a Wi-Fi um, network in the room. It's actually IHG One Rewards. It should be free, so sign on to that. If you can't uh, get signed up, go out and ask uh, Jamie out front on the registration table, and she'll help you get signed up um, for that. Um, real quick, uh, raise your hand if you're actually still working primarily remotely. Uh, as, as a, yeah, okay. So that's actually why we're in this business uh, today, today, now still. Um, there's really no mechanism for all of you folks to actually get together and have uh, real in-person um, meetings and face-to-face and -face interaction. And uh, again, it's just more fodder for why we're, we're glad we're still out there doing things like this and bringing um, ways to get together uh, out in public, <laughs> not on Zoom so you can actually get things done and build meaningful relationships. So we're, we're glad you're here. Okay, so to kick things off, we, uh, you'll be seeing a couple of these as we go. Um, these are sponsor presentations that educate you on uh, the, the different tools and resources that are available out in the marketplace so that you can monetize and do a better job, monetize, uh, do a better job of, of actually realizing revenue and, and other, um, um, uh, other ways to uh, maximize performance on your, on your own uh, properties back at the office. Uh, today, we're going to kick things off with a short presentation from uh, a great partner of ours. It's uh, Monetize, powered by Ad Media. Ad Media, uh, the parent company, has been sponsoring lots of things with us over the course of the year and over the past couple of years. Um, I think they're doing about 14 events with us this year, which is fantastic. Uh, Gary Merkin, uh, who is the Director of Publisher Development at Monetize, um, is just going to take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about who they are, what they do, and why they're an important uh, cog in the publishing ecosystem. So with that, please warm welcome for Gary. Gary? Thank you, John, and thank you everyone for showing up. And um, thank you for the fireworks show from last night and uh, the water show. I haven't been that wet since uh, I, you know, Splash Mountain down at uh, Disney. So um, I'm here because John said I have a presentation. It then turned into a short presentation, then it turned into a couple of minutes. So I'm, I'm very happy about that, actually. <laughs> so uh, by way of background, I'm a rec recovering publisher myself. I was former publisher of Ink. Sure, there you go. You want me to lean in? Um, anyway, I was the publisher of Ink, Fast Company, American Lawyer, and a couple of other brands which uh, I was honored to be publisher of and um, made it to the dark side here to uh, <laughs> the ad, ad tech side of the world about nine, ten years ago. I've been with ad media and monetized for the last year working on publishers and helping them, guess what, try and monetize their sites and mine the areas of their sites that they're not equipped to do themselves, that they're basically, um, you know, resource challenged and, and uh, unable to build search tools and things like that. I'm not going to go through the deck, by the way, because John said a couple of minutes. But um, So what we do, if you can imagine a platform, on one side of our platform, we're a DMP, and we have tons of data, first-party data, that we can then bring to brands like Kohl's or Wayfair or BMW or Mercedes-Benz, whoever it might be, uh, financial services, travel, CPG, and we connect those brand budgets to publishers like yourselves and we deliver that through search, search engine traffic and internal search from your site, not, not external search. Our ability to be able to, um, to get you more revenue because we have the direct brand relationship is what makes you more profitable. And it's all based on performance and web share and um, uh, that's basically our story. So, John, you told me, you know, five to ten minutes. That's five to ten minutes. I will ask if anybody has any questions on search and or, you know, um, contextual search, contextual advertising, 
and ways of monetizing that. We're all here. I have Sabrina Sparkman here, who is a fantastic team major, uh, member, and Rachel Coppolo here, who's a fantastic team member. So um, keep it there. All right. Good. You Man, that was, that was succinct, my friend. Great work. And I didn't need that. <laughs> you're going to... You're going to put the uh, presentation clicker business out of business. You didn't even use it. Um, get with these. Uh, thank you, Gary. That was fantastic. And, and seriously, we have three days to, uh, to riff on, on uh, some of the things that, that uh, these guys are doing uh, for, for publishers. So please get with the team. You're here for the duration, correct? Okay, good. So uh, thanks, thanks for keeping it succinct. We appreciate it. And we'll get to the, the rest of the meat of the act right now. So uh, what? What's that? Let's do it. Let's, let's do it. You ready to roll? All right, so Steve Smith. Steve Smith has been with Media Post for at least 20 years, one of our longest standing uh, writers and reporters. Uh, he moved over to events uh, to be exclusive as our uh, event programming head. He heads up all, different, uh, all the different shows that we run over the course of a, of, of a year. It's over 30 uh, conferences and events that we hold, and Steve Smith is our programming to head and make sure that uh, everyone is, uh, is, is on task and up to snuff for the different categories that we're covering. Um, Steve, what can I say about you? Steve is, you don't like it. You don't like it. I always introduce him, he hates it. I'm just going to do it. Steve, uh, Steve uh, let's see, he loves cartoons. He loves old comics. He loves old comic books. He's a former professor at the University of Virginia. Go Cavaliers. Is that right? That's not right. Go Cavs. Uh, former professor and also um, uh, just one hell of, oh, and he smokes a pipe and he's one hell of a guy. Uh, please give it up for Steve Smith, your MC and your lead programmer for the event. Take it away. Um, but uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks. I've been covering this, this field for many, many years. Um, in fact, I'm, the other thing that John didn't mention is that in two weeks I turned 65, uh, which is sort of made me a little reflective. Um, yeah, I, I applied for Medicare the other day. Um, but it has made me a little reflective um, and, a little, and, and put me in a bit of a summation mode. And I have been covering you guys in particular, the publishing world. Uh, since 1995. In fact, my first gig was writing about the internet and CD-ROMs. Remember CD-ROMs? For Cyber Surfer Magazine. Does anybody remember Cyber Surfer Magazine? It was one of the first magazines about the internet. Uh, it was edited by, anybody want to take a guess? Who was the, uh, the editor of Cyber Surfer? Jason Calacanis, who went on to, say, <laughs> who, who, is who is now Elon's best buddy. Um, and I, and one of the first trade stories that I covered was the coming of Pathfinder. Um, the, uh, which, Jeff, you want to click over to, to our, our early view of, of Pathfinder? If anybody is old enough to remember what the first foray into the electronic newsstand looked like, this was it. Um, it was one of the first stories that I covered was Time Warner's launch of Pathfinder, which was supposed to aggregate all of their, uh, their, their content into one spot that looked like a digital newsstand. Uh, and this is what the internet looked like to publishers in 1995. It looked like a big newsstand, another distribution channel. That's the way they thought about it. It was a mistake then, it's a mistake now, and yet I think it's a mistake that we continue to make. Um, that was the first of three decades of, uh, of, incredible, of incredibly hapless and, and often stupid calls that major media has made about, about the digital universe, about combinations that they've put together, about concessions that they've made, and about calls that they've made and investments that they've made, um, on the way to finally maybe coming closer to embracing what the internet really is about. Um, I made a lot of those bad calls myself, by the way. I don't, I don't absolve myself at all. I was underwhelmed by the iPhone and the iPad. There are still people at MediaPost who have saved those columns that, ca that cast aspersions on both of those devices and they send them to me. I thought in 2000 that the AOL Time Warner uh, merger was exactly that marriage of old and new that would move us forward into the next age of the internet. Um, there is, however, one thing that um, I think that I did get right about um, early on that I noticed, and some of this came from my background studying media, uh, is that while most media executives I talked to were talking about the internet as a distribution vehicle, as a new uh, electronic newsstand, one of the things that struck me early on 
uh, was that this medium truly is un was unlike everything else before it. But one of the things that it really was close, had uh, aspects of that were really more like a telephone than it was a newsstand. And this was something that I, um, that I kept on talking to executives about throughout the 1990s. And it was a pretty hard sell uh, because we were all talking about interactivity, but it was more than interactivity, it was intimacy. That's one of the things that struck me about some of the, uh, about the early internet and what maybe the secret sauce was here. Because we had a killer app very early on and that was email. Uh, we saw in the early forums, we saw in the BBSs uh, that a lot of sites hosted, a lot of content that publishers could not figure out how to monetize. Remember those early days when you could not sell any advertising at the forums? Uh, but the numbers showed that that's where the engagement was, that's where the energy was, um, and that's where people really were most responsive and, uh, came and, and came back again and again and again. Obviously, fast forward another decade, uh, Facebook, Google, and, and Apple all understood that, um, and they ate everybody's lunch as a result. Um, and for many, many years, the media, I think, kept paying lip service to this idea that um, about the wonderful interactivity of, the, of digital that they were finally getting it. But I don't think that major media and major media brands ever fully embraced that. They really wanted to keep doing what they were doing for a century of electronic ma mass media, which was to disseminate and not to converse. And understanding that the internet was really about conversation, that that's where the energy and the engagement was, is I think the thing that we kept missing for many, many years. And I say all of this only because I think we, far, we are finally at a moment, historically, where we're starting to see major media engage that and better understand and think about the ways in which they can deal with their audiences more intimately, a different relationship with them, and a different relationship that their audiences have with the media that they produce. And I think that's where we're, get, we're starting to move into, and I think some of the content over the next few days will show that. I think we're starting to think harder about the ways in which we can weave the media that we're good at making into the kind of experiences and engagement and interactivity and communication that people really want. We're seeing the return, for instance, simple enough, of the homepage. Finally, after years of distributing and, and throwing, our, uh, and throwing our, our brands and our content everywhere else, we're finally starting to re reconvene and take control of the media experience again, not only at websites, but especially in apps. The metaverse. Uh, something that has been here all along. It's been in, world, in, in war, of, uh, uh, war of Warcraft, um, a World of war Warcraft and Fortnite and Roblox and Twitch. It's been here all along, but finally we're starting to see that uh, media companies and major brands are starting to look at the ways in which they can understand what that universe is about and play where people are playing. Um, the rise of the newsletter that we've been talking about over the last couple of years and these platforms, they're using that one-to-one -one email channel to reestablish and commit to a, a greater level of intimacy, to drill into deeper niches, and to get one-to-one -one communication with readers again, and to engage them with individual personalities. Again, closer to the telephone than to the newsstand. In fact, niche is the new, is the new mass. Uh, intimacy is back. It is in those narrow areas of interest, those niches that we're finally starting to see publishers try to build better business models around and try to scale up as businesses, even as, even as, even as they maintain that more narrow focus on the audience that we're really starting to see take off here. Um, and we're really starting to see publishers, and some of them will be on this stage over the next few days, they're trying to create business structures around pulling those niches together. Um, and try, trying to find the ways in which they can support a diverse creator community, marry their media with other people's creation. That's where a lot of the creativity is going on. But even in CTV, for instance, which theoretically has uh, infinite possibilities for content, we're starting to see media companies drill into that content with ever more narrow niches of content where they can finally uh, make video content that really matters to people, take the lessons of YouTube and bring it to TV. Uh, similarly, podcasting, I think, uh, is one of those places where we really are, many companies continue to be surprised, uh, not only at the, the level of engagement and the ways in which podcasting can be used to drill those niches so much more effectively, but the level of intimacy that surprises all of us that happens between the listener uh, and, and the maker here. Um, so we're not talking, and the other thing, we're not talking in the last couple of years about scale anymore. 
you really are starting to talk about discrete audiences, relationships with audiences, the ways in which media works within people's lives and how we can craft businesses around it. It's not just media, it's communications. And just a little bit, a little bit of, um, when we really are ta now starting to talk about and think about content as connection, as shared experiences, not broadcasting. And I think that's a really important, subtle move in our thinking about media. The Latin root of communication, after, after all, is communis. It means to, uh, to make common, to share. And that's really at the heart of communication. Uh, it behooves us, I think, to think harder and better uh, when a new highly interactive um, medium takes off, to better understand the ways in which uh, the internet is really about communication and not just about media. TikTok, for instance, is a great example. Uh, it took the basic media concept of Periscope, which was brilliant, but sort of laid fallow, and it found a way to integrate traditional media music licensing into that mix and then use it as a, a way to platform creators and drive, crea and drive creativity. It is in many ways a pure mashup of old and new. It was a creative way of dealing with that divide between old and new and to, enter and to energize and make interactive co old content. Um, there should be lessons here, I think, for all of us. So instead of doing the usual thing when we look at a new platform like a TikTok or a Twitch or a Roblox, and say, how do we leverage this? How do we access those same audiences? Uh, how do we ride this train? How do we use it as a distribution medium? I think the better, more existential question is, um, what are the dynamics here that are at work that make this so appealing among media, among creator and community that TikTok has built? How can we learn lessons from this? And how can we better understand that this represents a different relationship with the audience and a different relationship that we have to have with our own content in order to bring them together? I think we see inklings of this throughout the agenda. Um, I just throw that out there as a possibility, as a higher way of thinking at the movement that we're making and where we are historically in the internet because I think a lot of the things that we'll see on this stage over the next few days uh, really will communicate that. But for those of you who have not been to the summit before, just a few things about the basic summit concept and how do I think to, be to get the most out of it. Um, everything on stage for the first three hours every morning is all on the record. We're recording it, we're reporting on it, consider it all on the record. But then at noon, we go off stage, and the real heart of our summits takes place in these roundtables. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of committing to one of the roundtables, because that's really where the content on stage gets activated into conversations, into things you'll be able to talk about when you go off in the afternoon on all of our planned sojourns and in the evening. So don't go off and grab your phone and, 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 and take a meeting. Commit to the roundtables, because we've known over 18 years of doing this that that's really the thing that activates this and makes them work. Um, and I want to start out sort of, I think, by something that segues out of what I was talking about, which is our keynote conversation uh, with Deb Brett of Condé Nast. Uh, Condé Nast is a company that, of course, represents some of the oldest media brands on the planet. Uh, but I want to tell a little anecdote to set this up. Um, I had already been talking to Deb about coming and speaking at the event, but then in the course of this, I get an email uh, from uh, our editor-in-chief, Joe Mandizi. He had just come away from the Digital New Fronts and had seen Condé Nast presentation. Joe, Joe has, as I'll, as I'll tell you in a second, Joe has been at this a long time. He's seen a lot of upfront and new front presentations. And he's, he said to me, they just, Condé Nast just gave one of the best presentations I have ever seen at, at any of these events. Uh, we should get them for publish. Uh, and so we do. Uh, because in many ways they're starting, they're thinking harder about the ways in which a lot of these legacy brands can be moved into these new modes of interactivity. Uh, and the role I think that quality plays. Uh, Deb is the, uh, is the global chief business officer of, at Digital at Condé Nast. She's, uh, she's responsible for revenue strategy and innovation. Uh, she is one of the, uh, the prime movers in moving Condé Nast to a digital first approach and also a lot of the initiatives that we'll be talking about here. Interviewing her is our own Joe Mendes. Joe has been our editor-in-chief for many, many years, is a veteran of, of covering the trade going back into the 1980s. Please welcome Joe and Deb.
Now? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, well, uh, thanks for those intros. That was awesome. Um, as chief, uh, as global chief business officer, you are the rock star here because we're a business to business uh, industry here. This is uh, trade publishing and um, the um, history is, is interesting because I did start out in the 80s covering this thing called television and I was always jealous of the print reporters who got, got to cover Condé Nast because as a journalist, it was my favorite ends, connecting consumer brands with consumers. And however you do that, whatever the mix is, that's what determines your success. And what I loved about your presentation this year was how integrated you were. I was surprised that Condé Nast is now one of the largest video distributors in the world, billions of views a year across many countries. Um, you know, I was shocked. So on that note, I just kind of wanted to open up on one of the key points from the new front, which was what I think your secret sauce is and the thing that everybody in this room could learn from, which is that publishing brands, particularly editorial, journalistically driven ones, are about culture. You know, they're about um, covering culture. But in the case of Condé Nast, you're so um, ambitious as to say you actually drive it and influence it. And I think that's part of your um, positioning statement that I took away. And I'd like you to talk about this particular concept, culture being the new KPI, and what does that really mean? And explain how other people in publishing can leverage that idea. Sure, thank you so much, thanks for having me. So, I'm gonna take us back a few years. We're mid-COVID, and all of our advertisers are obsessed with conversion metrics, with data-driven strategies, with the bottom of the funnel. This is no good for me at Condé Nast. That is not the business that I'm in. But what we kept finding again and again is that these brands would cut their spend, they'd vanish, and then a little time would pass and they'd come back begging for help. Because they spent so much time in the bottom of their funnel, they forgot they needed to keep filling it from the top. So we know our brands are driving wantedness. This is sort of a, a common sense truth. You read about fashion in vogue, it makes you want to go out and buy what you saw. But it was really hard to prove when everybody was looking at last click attribution. So we actually did a study with Deloitte. And what they were able to help us tease out was that it was cultural relevance above all else that was ultimately driving that intent. And so we really started to lean into how we could prove that culture needed to be the KPI or really engaging with cultural relevance for your brands needed to be the KPI above all else or every other data-driven solution was going to ultimately fall flat. And it's been relatively rewarding for us right now as the industry is facing cookie deprecation, privacy prompts, conversion metrics falling off a cliff because we've been in advance of that building the right solutions to prove performance and to prove that we can drive outcomes by connecting brands and advertisers in really meaningful ways at the right time when an advertiser is receptive and in that culturally relevant context. So is it, um, it's a great positioning statement. Is it inspirational or is it a hard metric? Is it an actual KPI that you can show culture lift with? It's a hard metric, and that's what's changed a lot in the last few years. We're seeing so many partners in the measurement and in the performance space kind of meet us where we were trying to be a few years back with attention metrics, quality scores, working with partners like Moach or Adelaide, with our SSPs, being able to really think about how not only can you use attention quality and that cultural relevance in order to prove value, but you can also start to think about it as a currency and a way to transact. So for us, it's been incredibly valuable. We launched something called our cultural calendar, which you saw in our new front, and this for us was kind of a, a sales tool because we needed to take an old, more traditional programming grid, if you will, and start to think about how we could lay out cultural moments, these relevance opportunities, in a buyable way. 
it's really abstract to think about as an agency or as a marketer or as a buyer, how do I map my initiatives to what you guys are doing as the Condé Nast brands to build that culture? And by simply flipping that script and letting culture become programming, it really started to facilitate the transaction, which for me on the business side is kind of what we're here for. So is this an actual calendar, like a media kit calendar that people can access? And uh, is it something other publishers sh should think about using? We still have an events calendar that our team puts together that drives a lot of our, you know, moments. But how does that work for you? Absolutely. I think what we did is we really figured out that any event, any moment in culture, whether it's one that we own or one that we cover, really was this multi-platform viable opportunity. And so if we could lay it all out, anything from Vanity Fair showing up at film festivals to who's gonna be on the cover of one of our magazines, is that your spokesperson? That's an opportunity, that's culture that's being created. All of these things became a way to program and a way to connect an advertiser's campaign initiatives in their calendar with the things that we knew we were, be it, we were building or creating that were gonna build that buzz, create that energy, and give that opportunity for, at Condé Nast, what we really like to focus on is incrementality. How did we level this up? How did we take whatever was happening in the world, tell that story through the lens of our brands, and make sure that our advertisers could really benefit from that and find that incrementality? And to your earlier question, we're really lucky that so many of our platform and measurement partners have focused so much on incrementality measurement tools that can show us the difference between just being on Instagram versus being on Instagram through the lens of Vogue. So um, you create your own cultural event moments, obviously through your editorial products, but you also basically appropriate some of the world's greatest ones I think Fashion Week and Vogue and Super Bowl and, Con and um, GQ Sports and Vanity Fair and the Oscars, um, you have the prerogative, the right to go in because of the relationship your audience has with your coverage of those things. And as I heard in your upfront, you actually generated more impressions than ABC did with the Oscars. Um, so where do you take that next? How do you leverage that up? And um, you know what I'm teeing up here, which is, in particular, um, the thing you presented on Vogue World and how you took this, you know, week in New York, this special issue of Vogue magazine each fall, and turn it into, you know, an extravaganza, really. Yeah, so we're really lucky because at our core, even though we're content, even though we're publishers, at our core, we're journalists. And so we are welcome in to other people's events, right? We often get told about our competitors, but our competitors are often our biggest partners, and we like to co-create content together. And I think that what Connie and Ask can do really well is bring that impeccable layer of that high-value storytelling that only Condé can that's additive, even to somebody who might have considered themselves a competitor in the content creation landscape. What we did with Vogue was we looked internally at the September issue, that big, thick, foam book-sized issue of Vogue that we do every year that is covering everything happening in fashion in the fall. And historically, that had been a magazine. And this year, we'd been thinking about it and working on it and noodling with it for a while. But this past year in Manhattan, it became a street fair. It became a runway show. It became a live stream. It became an e-commerce destination. It became content on YouTube, on TikTok, on Twitter. You know, everywhere that we could possibly connect with our consumers, we were bringing that lens of Vogue's editorial point of view on what's happening in fall fashion and really bringing it to life. And that gave our advertisers a huge opportunity to integrate on the ground, to connect directly with A-list celebrities all over the place, instantaneous relevance. And so thinking about how something as sort of storied and as old-fashioned, if you will, as a magazine could come alive on every conceivable platform where a consumer might meet our brands. Well, what I love about it is um, you referenced the idea that 
get the metaverse, you're a multiverse, meaning all these platforms. And importantly, the central one for this event is a real world experience. It's actually live on the streets of New York or ne next one in London. I think you're going to Asia and back to Europe. Um, how important is in real life becoming to you, even though you're now a predominantly digital brand? You know, I think the real life application is in part the most exciting way that we can connect. So Vogue was just in Cannes for the film festival, Vanity Fair too. And we threw amazing parties, of course, like we always do, and co-hosted them with Chopard and with Prada. But what we get out of that is not just this incredibly exclusive opportunity to rub shoulders with celebrities in the most beautiful parts of the world. We also create branded content that comes out of that. We create a ton of earned media. There's all kinds of ways that those moments in reality can become the most significant in terms of creating culture. There's so much happening on the internet that's there and it's gone. I mean, the, the level of virality, the speed of virality right now, how quickly something can become the biggest thing ever and then totally irrelevant. There is something very legitimate and very lasting about creating that real world opportunity and that idea of you know, community and that idea of connection that and maybe this is like the post COVID trauma in me talking, but I think people are desperate for that more and more. And I, I'm always thinking about how we can expand further into the ways that we could be activating in real life. So on the flip side of that, you are multi-platform um, and you are heavily digital. Um, do you see yourself going deep into the metaverse and are there any new Web3 things you're developing to expand your presence further digitally and virtually? You know, I think <laughs> this is maybe counterintuitive, but I think I'm sitting in a really lucky position because I come from a legacy print business and technology has been trying to put me out of business for a really long time. And so we're constantly evolving. We look at every single change or shift in the marketplace as an opportunity. And so thinking about how brand value can become intrinsic and ownable with things like blockchain, thinking about creating IRL experiences that, that could then be replicated in a much more accessible way, right? Condé Nast, we're always trying to walk the line between you can't sit with us at our super cool party and how do we invite you in and let you feel like you're a part of it. So things like the metaverse are so exciting for us. Things like artificial intelligence become so exciting. You know, everybody thinks that publishers should be hiding from the existential dread of AI, but for me, there's so much more we wanna do from the voice of our editors, right? When I started at Vogue, I remember the creative director pulled me aside and she said, Deb, our readers don't want our magazine on a website. They wanna be able to ask the editor what to wear to a bar mitzvah in Austin in June. Now obviously scaling up that level of personalization would be impossible if we thought about it with our old school model. But when we can train AI to add a layer of personalization or an ease or a speed or a utility on top of what we're gonna to continue to do as those editorial curatorial voices, that's where I really start to get excited about how big we can make our brand opportunity without ever losing that authenticity. Yeah, I'll admit I only read two print publications, not even newspapers anymore, and one of them is The New Yorker. Um, it's a different experience, um, but I'm looking forward to the day I can be sitting in a multiverse experience with David Remnick having a conversation. Will we get to the point where people can access your Vanity Fair post Oscar event or something like that? You know, it's something we talk about all the time. Anybody who pays attention to the Met Gala knows that it's huge coverage. It's everywhere you look. Every single news publication is covering it. We're streaming it. We've got it on Instagram. We've got it everywhere. And then just as the red carpet ends, it stops. You can't look inside. So we always try to walk the line of how much we make things open and how much we show versus how much we keep a little bit of exclusivity and a little bit of secrecy and a little bit of FOMO or wantedness. There's also an important role that we have to play in terms of 
trust with celebrities. You know, we have this amazing opportunity that really A-list talent is willing to have very intimate and open conversations with us, let us into their homes through AD's open door, lie detector with Vanity Fair, really incredible close connection. And that only happens because they know we're always gonna make them look good. So we do have to sort of walk that line of what happens behind closed doors and then what happens for the mass populace to enjoy. Yeah, if you haven't seen the New Front, I think you can still see it on the IAB okay. New Front's website. I encourage, there's a lot of great nuggets, but one of them is the editor of Vanity Fair explains how they actually compile the Oscar party list, so that's worth listening to. Um, so will we get to uh, Anna Wintour GPT soon? <laughs> you know, I really hope so. I think there's so much opportunity for us as an industry as we start to embrace and evolve with this kind of technology. I think that, you know, what worries me the most about us as publishers is that we waste time trying to hold on to old models. You know, I love the death of the cookie. I love it because for me, context is my cookie. And if I can actually get the rest of the industry to lean into that and to stop chasing third-party data metrics that, let's be real, we're never that accurate to begin with. We just were so comfortable with them, so they became the standard currency to transact. Now we're sort of being forced to move on to be more consumer-centric, to respect people's privacy, to respect their choice, and you know, for brands like mine, at least, that's a winning position. People choose Vogue, and for me to figure out how to make that lean into a constantly evolving tech-enabled landscape is a really exciting growth proposition as instead of something to try to stop future from happening, right? We don't ever want to stop the world from evolving. We want to figure out how we evolve authentically within that opportunity. Yeah, no, I agree. The, um, I think the creation of consumer tracking IDs and behavioral targeting was the thing that deprecated editorial brands because we were the things that brought the contextual context of the audience to the brand, and I think it hurt. Um, but at the same time, you do play in that field. Um, you did a deal with Teeds as part of a group of publishers earlier this year. Um, that's part of the game. Um, how do you walk those two worlds of contextual versus behavioral, identity graphs, things like that? In general, I feel like I don't need to abandon things that are still working. I just need to be constantly staying ahead and constantly evolving. So the way that we manage our businesses in Europe is quite different from how we manage them here in the US based upon what's going on with those industries. The thing that we love the most about our programmatic partners in particular is they help us with adoption, with ubiquity, right? With standardization. So I can do moat measurement that shows you that the attention quality for my brands is so much higher, and then therefore the outcomes and the intents are so much higher from the consumers who were engaged. But if it's only me, this one small publisher trying to prove that out, you know better than anyone, that's not gonna scale. That's not gonna become the currency that replaces the third party cookie or last click attribution. So the more that I can work with Teeds, with the Trade Desk, with Moat, with Adelaide, with all of these companies that are leaning into how do we measure attention metrics in a consistent way. Now we can start thinking about scaling enough to become a currency. You know, it was only what, January, that the IAB started talking about attention metrics. Was that champagne bottle going up? <laughs> No, I guess IAB is listening. <laughs> but, but um, you know, the thing about it is they can give us guidance, but it requires all of us kind of coming together and deciding we are going to create something standard that agencies, marketers, and publishers can all trust in to be able to benchmark and to be able to transact against some of these new indicators to go beyond verification you know, viewability was great, transparency is important, but how do we take the next step and get into that quality conversation? 
Yeah, I didn't mean to sing, single out TEADS, but you're working with all the platforms. Attention metrics is definitely a next new thing. But going back to this idea of first party data, I think Condé Nast was always a leader there. Going back to the 80s when I was covering the business, you were doing some of the best first party research with your own subscribers. It was better than the MRI or Simmons data of that day. Um, I don't think you've lost that. You're audience wants to be part of the Condé Nast experience. How do you leverage that first party connection you have with your subscribers and your readers and your viewers for brands? So we're constantly trying to engage our community. We're trying to learn from them about how they want us to show up, where we can be not just an inspiration, but also a utility. And we have a lot of direct communication with our clients, whether it's on our platforms or on our site or through some of those more facilitated focus groups and things like that. We use that information in all kinds of ways. You know, I can look at the context of a page, the template type of the page. Is this e-commerce? Am I here to research something? Am I here for a recommendation? Am I here for a long read? And I can understand from what's in my CMS, what is the mindset of this person? I can use all of those indicators to help me deliver exactly the right message in a time when it's going to be meaningful. You know, I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but you can look in your profile on Instagram in the ads section about who they think you are and what ads they think are relevant to you. And it's wild how wrong it is. You know, like this one time I scroll by a reel of a giant fish getting caught and I'm like, ooh, look at that fish. And now they think I'm a target for fishing campaigns. <laughs> it's just, I'm not, I'm never gonna go fishing, ever. <laughs> it was just a cool fish. So there's like first party data can be just as misinforming as third party data was. And it's all about making sure that you're using enough of these layered signals to really understand. I could be, I could look at a, a keyword like hotels and say this would be a great contextual indicator for this airline that wants to advertise their new first class, you know, going to Europe. But what if it's hotels about spring break trips, right? That's not relevant at all. So how do I make sure that I'm looking at enough of all of these different layers of first party data, even down to the CMS, to really inform doing something that's going to break through? And then how do I take all those insights and actually make creative with my advertisers so that it looks and acts like the content environment and stops that kind of tissue rejection we all have of ads, 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 and starts to feel like additive and incremental content. And that's honestly the legacy of Vogue and of Condé Nast, where if you flip through one of our magazines, the ads are just as valuable to the reader experience as the content. You wouldn't want to pick up the September Vogue and not be able to see all those beautiful full page ads from all of the amazing fashion houses around the world. So we try to think about that in terms of how we activate for digital revenue to make sure that those online ads are also additive as opposed to chasing me around the internet trying to get me to buy fishing lures. Yeah, as an editor, I've always had an aversion to uh, digital native content, but you have a legacy of doing it right where the content is part of the editorial experience. So uh, are there any tips you can give the people in this room? I know it's a competitive industry, but that either on that front or on this concept of cultural calendars, is there anything you can impart to um, the people in this room that they can take away and apply in their own businesses without stealing your, your share of market? <laughs> I think for us, it's really this dichotomy of content and partnerships. We have to make sure that we are always true to this authenticity, this journalistic integrity, this editorial voice. And sometimes we have to say no to things that could maybe be pretty lucrative because they don't make sense for our brands, for our audiences. But if we do that and we build a business model that protects and preserves our brand reputation, it sets us up to survive forever. And simultaneously, it sets us up to be welcomed in by all of our partners. Condé Nast cannot succeed without broad scale distribution. We're on 80 different platforms in 31 different markets right now. It's a lot to manage. 
but it's the way that we make sure that we can be everywhere our fans are and everywhere our advertisers need to be. And by programming into all of those places, we can protect ourselves from whatever might happen, whatever platform gets banned or boycotted. We can always make sure that we're evolving into where the consumers want to be and where the advertisers feel safe. I don't think that the platforms would welcome us in the same way or give us that first to market or beachfront real estate if they didn't trust the content that the editorial teams are producing. So really balancing the partnership of those two different sides is what's made us be able to stay so relevant and to be a digital first company, even though I think our first print publication launched in 1709. Any questions for Deb? Uh, uh, throughout the event, if you have a question, please uh, let us get to know you. Stand up. Tell us who you are and who you're with. And just raise your hand and wave it wildly, because again, 65, bad eyes. <laughs> so a uh, 130-year-old publishing company, as you described, big transformation from web presses and newsstand distribution to today. But you, you also dabble in some of these other how should I say it, hyper-fragmented areas of the world. Um, you have, so Ken Fadner, our, our founder and, and the CEO, um, once coined a phrase for me, like the most successful media companies are organizing principles. They organize markets and consumers, and I think your main titles do that. On the other end, you have companies like Reddit, which is the opposite extreme. It's sub, 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 narratives of discussions. Um, are you thinking of playing more in that world or is your main focus on the Iconic brands? So specifically from the, the lens of Condé Nast, the main focus is always on those Iconic brands. How do we honor the brand value and make it accessible to consumers and to marketers to really drive impacts, drive experiences? But I do think that more and more and more, we're discovering that the need to use these less curated environments in order to build the communities who ultimately want to tap into highly curated environments, that two-way street is something that we're constantly thinking about how we evolve, how we connect more in that one-to-one. -one. Right now, we're very heavily focused on the one-to-many. Sorry, I lost my voice. Everybody knows this. Um, first of all, great presentation, Deborah. You speak very well. Thank you. Um, I am interested. My name is Anne Midday. I'm at Kinetics, and I love the September issue. And I'm really curious about what you were talking about, what you did this past year with the September issue and making it, like especially in New York, a more interactive, like live event. And I'm curious, and if there isn't an answer, that's fine. I'm curious if there was any technology or vendor that you saw um, that you hadn't seen previously that really rose to that challenge or maybe like an e-commerce technology that was um, something you leaned in on during that September issue um, experiment. Yeah, it's a great question. And you know, the thing that has always been kind of a problem about covering Fashion Week or really Fashion Month, the many weeks of fashion, is that you can't buy any of it, right? This is all aspirational stuff that's not in stores yet. And what our Vogue editorial team did is by curating this Manhattan street fair turned runway show, is they made it all see it, shop it. So every single thing that we featured on the models walking the runway, and the models were all kinds of famous people, athletes and Mikhail Baryshnikov, I mean, just you name it but everything that you saw, you could buy. And you could buy it on our site via e-commerce tools. And you know, I'll tell you, we weren't sure what to expect and the reaction was wild. So it was a really strong indicator and back to your earlier point about how much we're always studying the consumer behavior and what it tells us. What it told us is that people are looking for that inspiration to convert into a real-time purchase for something that historically seemed you know, very aspirational and sort of dreamlike. And so we're really trying to think about how the September issue can be that curated lens, but also be really actionable. So 
live streaming was huge for us. And we live streamed in many different places. And again, this is not a, a core competency of Condé Nast. We're not a tune in. We're a huge video player, but not live. And so to know that people wanted to sit there on YouTube or on Twitter or on Instagram and be able to, in real time, watch this experience that was happening in New York was a huge indicator for us of places that we could continue to, to develop. This year, Vogue World is taking place in London, but we expect the US-based audience to be just as big as it was when it was in Manhattan. So you managed to take shoppable media into shoppable couture. Yes. Um, doesn't that defeat the whole idea of exclusivity and specialness? You know, I think it goes back to what I was saying before. There's this modern appeal to being able to walk the line, to being able to do something that's really exclusive but also has a, a lane that's accessible, to do something that's aspirational but also achievable. And you know, I don't think we'll ever let anybody go inside the Met Gala, but every year we do more and more and more to make that red carpet as accessible anywhere anybody might possibly want to tune in around the world. So it's a balance, and it's a balance that I think Condé Nast really has to focus on because we lose that, that incrementality, that specialness, if we don't maintain this level, but nobody wants somebody to leave them out. That's not where our culture is going. Inclusivity is what people are looking for, and so finding the right way to be elevated and impeccable, but still inclusive, is critical for our North Star. Hi, Deborah. Thank you for the insights. They're super informative and helpful. My name is Jason Green. Uh, I head up pub dev and product at a company called Fastener. It's sort of an omnidirectional sure. marketplace. Um, my question's operational, really. Uh, so I remember sitting in Condé Nast in your offices in New York maybe 10 years ago, uh, and there were some conversations around, you know, whether or not to uh, convert content to iPad, and this is relatively early days, right? Um, the conversation got stuck because you had multiple publications and each one of them had a, a department head um, who was maybe was dealing with the audience and then you had a, a single corporate development person who had to orchestrate all of those changes and make those decisions. So being on so many platforms, I'm just really curious about how you and your role, if you would share, how you manage all of those different leaders across those publications to push innovation, to push change, is that centralized or does it remain decentralized? Wow, you just like, I feel so seen. Feels like another panel <laughs> discussion. Thank you for that question. So as the operator of our digital revenue business globally, it's been a mountain of work. You know, historically, Condé Nast was two completely separate companies, Condé Nast International and Condé Nast US, and historically, we were a print company. Now we've globalized, we've brought everything together, and we're a digital first company. And all of that happened in the last four years. So it's been a huge amount of infrastructure work, change management, operational standardization. It's a work in progress. I would say we, we're getting much, much, much better at being able to execute across the same platforms, centralizing ad accounts, instances of GAM, what have you. But I think we're constantly trying to balance, again, between the idea of global versus local. We want to make sure that we're giving the global infrastructure, the global toolkits, the global content syndication. But journalistic brands are not going to be able to have cultural relevance if they lose that local connection. So how do we make sure that we're powering both sides of what our business needs to be for our advertisers to be able to execute? as well as for editorial teams to be able to share resources, but still do something that's personal or that's tailored to the market that they're trying to engage. So I would say global transformation is one of our biggest challenges. I think that's true for almost everyone. I think Condé Nast is uniquely a bit more global than a lot of our competitors, just given how many of our brands exist in so many different markets. So gluing them all together has been a huge labor of love, mostly love. <laughs> and, and I might add that four-year transformation coincides with your tenure there. That's true. Okay. I think that's why they hired me. Gavin, Joe, thank you so much for that. That was a great, great opening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Jen.